Hi, Crazy Towners. This is a share with a brief update. When Jason, Rob, and I set out to record material for the second season of our podcast, we had no idea just how crazy the world was going to get. The coronavirus pandemic has changed things for everyone, so we felt the need to change the show, too, to try to keep up. We're still releasing the episodes we recorded prior to the pandemic. In fact, in a weird sort of way, the topics have become all the more relevant, just like the last two episodes on extreme airline travel and insane global trade. But we're putting those pre-recorded episodes on a compressed schedule, releasing two per week and working in new episodes that address the social and environmental effects of the pandemic. We're kicking things off with a special interview I conducted with investigative journalist Nafiz Ahmed, a leading big picture thinker on the unfolding crises of our time. As we continue to work on new episodes, we love to hear from you and to try to answer some of your questions. So please send emails to crazytown at postcarbon.org. That's crazytown at postcarbon.org. Thanks, and please stay safe out there. So uh, I'm being joined by Nafiz Ahmed. It's nighttime you're where you are. It's morning time, or I guess it's late afternoon where you are. It's morning where I am. Um, just by way of a very short introduction, uh, Nafiz has been an investigative journalist, I think almost for 20 years now, close to that, right? Yeah. Um, and he's, uh, he's formerly an environmental writer at The Guardian, but he's also written for a bunch of other papers and magazines, The Independent, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, others. Um, you're currently the systems shift columnist at Vice, which at some point I'd like to understand more about because that's a pretty rare thing. Very few people, I think, acknowledge systems or thinking systems. Um, and that's actually one of the things I've really appreciated about your writing, uh, your writings for years now. Um, and you're also a research fellow at the Schumacher Institute. Before we sort of get into the conversation, I just want to know how, how things are with you. Where are you in the world and what's happening there with the, with the pandemic? And how are you coping? So, I mean, I think us personally as a family, I think um, we're really fortunate. Um, I feel to some extent compared to many other people in the UK and probably around the world, we're quite privileged. Um, we've, you know, we've kind of, we're kind of here kind of hold up in, in, uh, in London. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, as a family, I think we're, you know, it's been a shock, you know, I've got three kids, you know, they've had to you know, get out of school and all the rest of it. Um, uh, so we're kind of just adjusting to this new way of life, which I think everyone is now, uh, kind of thinking about what does this mean? Um, so that's dealing with that, dealing with managing the fact that we have elderly parents and relatives on both sides, mine, my wife mm-hmm. has been scary. Um, you know, the, 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 the concern that people close to you could actually, um, pass away as a result of getting this virus has been really alarming. Um, mm. something I think many people are experiencing. And so, you know, I remember, um, when I was telling my friends about this, um, I think when the virus first kind of made the news, I remember telling my colleagues at work and my friends that this is going to change the world. And they just kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? This is the fees is often one again, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this crisis collapse, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And, uh, it was actually a struggle, uh, even then trying to get people to realize what was coming. And I was constantly telling people, telling people in the office that, you know, guys, we're going to have to s- slow things down. We have to shut down. I'm not going to want to come to the office. Um, and they would just look at me like I was mad. Um, mm-hmm. And it's one of those situations where when things actually happen, you know, you don't feel vindicated. You just feel worse. Yeah. You know, you wish right. that you were wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's like that. And I think, I think you guys have probably experienced similar things with the you know, Post Carbon Institute has been ahead of the curve for many years. Um, on so many things um so i think for many of us it's been um i guess seeing the way things are happening has been shocking but also in some ways not entirely surprising that's the strange thing about it it's yeah i think the specificity of it is is always worrying alarming surprising but but so much that's happening is also things that you and i have been talking about um for years you know these kind of issues so there's all of that um but yeah so so i think personally it's been challenging but we're okay 
you know i think the biggest thing in our context um which i'm sure which i think in the states there is a parallel struggle is really um you know what's our government's doing mm -hmm. in response to this and as a journalist i've my response has been uh attempting to to cover the way the boris johnson administration has really essentially messed up its response in so many different ways i mean it's a combination of neoliberal ideology kind of bizarre scientist kind of fetishization of mathematical models mm. um coupled with complete idiocy and incompetence you know all in this perfect storm of failure um but you know kind of lurking behind the scenes i think and we've seen this with the trump administration is this is this kind of constant concern about stock markets constant concern about gdp constant concern about keeping business as usual afloat mm -hmm. um and that keeps kind of coming into conflict with um the fact that you know action needs to be taken um so so personally i've been responding a lot to that as a journalist as well yeah. um but I, but in, you know now i think the trump administration and the boris johnson administrations appear to be quite there's some coordination going on i mean the, the science paper that the, that kind of triggered the Brits into action also triggered the Trump right. administration in, into action, which is right. kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, it's all, it's, it's been fascinating for me to see from, from, you know, thousands of miles away. It feels like the, the UK government tried this, uh, well, let's just get, you know, uh, herd immunity or something going. Right. And, and then quickly, Hit the brakes on that, and and also almost, you know, hearing some of Johnson's rhetoric, he sounds like a socialist on some level. Some of the the plans, at least I've heard them talking about, um, are things you were sort of inconceivable before. On our end, we're seeing some of that too. But now we have Trump almost. Well, he you know he tried to dis dismiss this from the beginning and uh, and wish it away because it was inconvenient. Then it felt like the government was maybe taking some serious response. And now he's talking about opening it back up for Easter, like the, the resurrection of Christ. We're going to, the economy is going to come back, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, which is like, wow, what is going on? So clearly, you know, the whole idea of the emperor having no clothes, if we needed evidence that, that our technocrats, you know, in government and our political leaders don't really know what they're doing, kind of have evidence of that i think on a daily basis and psychologically yeah. i mean what you were saying i that's where for me um yeah i feel no vindication either you know uh we we've not spent a lot of time at pci warning specifically about risks associated with pandemics but we have like you i think have talked about systemic risks in the system mm -hmm. and that it's almost like you know it could be a shock from any angle will will tip the whole thing um, there's no satisfaction, you know, and if that's what this moment is and being right about that. And in fact, it's, there's a lot of consternation, I think for me to see people continuing to get it wrong, you know? Um, but I'm glad to know that your, your family's okay. People are probably bouncing off the walls. I imagine a little bit cause you're, you're stuck inside for hours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, I don't think it's quite kicked off yet. But yeah. yeah, it's like right. the kids are just, you know, it's, it's been, my wife is running around like doing homeschooling and working, mm. you know, I'm also working and then suddenly doing homeschooling yeah. and it's just nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. And, and depending on how long this lasts could have, you know, long-term impact on, on our kids, you know, um, yeah. which is, I mean, Look, other generations have gone through. You think about the generation of, of, of Brits who went through, you know, the bombings, right? Uh, hiding out, you know, fleeing the city, whatever, you know. Um, talk about psychologi psychological trauma. I mean, other generations have experienced it too. Being stuck inside, you know, and containment for weeks on end is pretty tame, I think, in comparison to some of those things, but probably will have an impact on people. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, I have, it's, uh, it's really difficult to kind of know where we're going as well, because there's so much confusion about how, you know, how long this process has to last. 
um, you know, how, you know, should it, can it be relaxed? Um, I think it's that, I think it's that uncertainty Mm -hmm. as to what comes next that is really kind of getting to everybody, you know, like what, is this it, you know, what, what's, where do we go from here, you know, and and what, and, you know, what's the impact on society and the economy going to be, and where does that leave us at the end of it? It's uh, something I think, which we, which people are very, very confused about. Yeah. Um, Well, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about some of the sort of systemic stuff. I mean, you'd written a piece, it was almost a month ago, um, talking, I think, a little bit about the systemic risks associated with the pandemic, you know, and at least in my view, really talking about the, the impacts of, of the virus on kind of structural faults that already exist in the global economic system, right, and how that might play out. Um, it feels like, you know, that was almost a lifetime ago that you wrote that piece. I, you know, I'd like to talk to you about how your thinking may have changed or how things have, have evolved over that time. But first, maybe you just take a minute and talk about some of like, maybe what your key, you know, focus was in that piece. And when you're talking about synchronous failure and global phase shift, what do you mean by that? So I think, um, so when I wrote that piece and I wanted to do, and apart from wanting to go through the data that we had on the coronavirus and kind of just get people to have to be able to actually have a sensible understanding of what's going on because there was just so much, there was so much misreporting and sensationalist reporting. And, you know, there has, there has been some really good reporting here and there. Mm-hmm. Um, but just to give people a sense of, you actually want to understand this thing, you know, what is it? Why is it happening? Why is it happening now? Um, and what does it mean for us? Um, and to have a framework to kind of understand that. So I kind of drew on a number of, uh, kind of systemic approaches you know which you know some of it is my own work but much of it has been pioneered by many other um uh, systems theorists so mm-hmm. synchronous failure the uh, its concept was developed by uh, uh professor thomas homer dixon um who kind of created this seminal concept which captured i think something which many analysts have been aware of but i think he really homed in on on uh, you know kind of the he kind of really finessed the structural kind of contours of how this might work but basically essentially said that you know we have very tightly coupled global systems now um and the risks that we have when we have very very complex global systems is that the more complex you get the when you have a kind of a big shift in one of these systems that it can have a destabilizing impact across multiple systems connected to it. And the danger that we have with where he came up with this either synchronous failure is what happens when your system, um, all of that complexity that's been built up over, over decades, if not centuries means that by the very same token, there is a kind of a lack of adaptivity and a lack of resilience, a lack of kind of being able to respond because you already have so much complexity. Um, And and every time there's a new problem, um, you have new complexity created. And and that idea kind of comes back to, um, you know, the uh, archaeologist Joseph Tainter, who talked about Mm -hmm. why is it that civilizations have this tendency to collapse throughout history? And he kind of identified this, this dynamic where civilizations get really complex to solve a problem, they get more complex and it gets to this point where um, the the civilization is simply not able to sustain that level of complexity and the new problems that come just cause that system to end up breaking down and you have this breakdown. So that, so in Thomas Homer Dixon kind of built on those ideas and came up with this framework to see how within our current system, you, know, you could have something like a climate change event or you could have a economic event or you could have a political event or something like a pandemic um, which would act as this you know seemingly by itself you look at that crisis and you wouldn't automatically assume that that's going to bring everything down but it's when it interacts with all of these other tightly coupled systems that it could create all of it could create this kind of um, almost like a tidal wave that just overwhelms the system's ability to actually respond properly um 
And then it triggers lots of other systems to have their own problems. And I think that's kind of what we're seeing now is, you know, we've got this, we've got this kind of domino effect on the economy, um, political systems going into disarray, and so on and so forth. And when each of those systems then has a kind of a breakdown, the question is, if all of those systems then have a breakdown, does that prevent your capacity to respond and actually deal with the problem? And once, once you're overwhelmed by all of your systems going into this failure, you then have what Thomas Homer Dixon calls this um, synchronous failure. And it's effectively like a breakdown in complexity mm-hmm. um, or a collapse of some kind. Um, you know, what's interesting about his approach is that he doesn't say, you know, he, he doesn't go into the detail of what happens next. You know, does this mean that the system, the, the, the collapse is some kind of massive apocalyptic breakdown or is it something slightly more um, kind of um, contained in some way? And is it, is it a long process? Is it a short process? It all depends on the context, but he gives us these tools to think about it. And I think there were, the, there were two, there were two other um, kind of theoretical kind of constructs or concepts that I really wanted people to, to understand when they were looking at the coronavirus and, and how to deal with it. And one of them was this idea that I had developed of the interaction between the Earth system and the human system. Um, and it was basically this, I mean, to break it down into, into, into a simple kind of way of seeing it, you know, you've got this, you've got an Earth system disruption, which is driven by the things we're very familiar with, whether it's climate change or or resource depletion or things like that. And in this case, um, I think we can, we can clearly see that something about the way in which human societies have expanded, industrial civilization kind of moving more and more into encroaching on wildlife and, and interfering with natural ecosystems has created this vulnerability towards diseases jumping to humans in different ways. Um, and the coronavirus, I mean, no, no one has been able to say yet that this was heightened by specifically the impact of climate change or specifically the impact of certain things. But scientists have been saying for years, if not decades, that a pandemic of some kind is going to happen. And they've been saying it because they're aware of all of these trends. And they're saying sooner or later, you know, this, you know, we're going to be hit by a pandemic. And, and, and actually, you know, what's worrying about it is the coronavirus is, is still, you know, the new coronavirus is, is, a, is a mild type of disease compared to unknown diseases that are out there and even diseases that we've had previously. It, it, it's not as bad as it could have been. In, in a way, it's almost like a dry run for a, a, another potential pandemic that could be around the corner if we, you know, we continued on this path of endless kind of expansion. Um, so you have this idea of Earth system disruption, and then you have the way in which that impacts on human systems. So then I have this idea of human system destabilization. And so, you know, your Earth, you know things will happen in the Earth system like this, and they will have these destabilizing impacts on the human system. Um, and as a result of that, what happens is often your uh, actors within the human system, they respond not directly to the earth system disruption, but instead they respond to its symptoms. And one of the examples that we could see just in recent history is, is for example, what's gone on in Syria, where we've had lots and lots of studies that have come out talking about how climate change uh, had this uh, was this kind of background uh, process that had exacerbated the drought cycle in Syria. It had kind of, you know, devastated farmers. Um, They had ended up migrating from the south into the, into the kind of the, um, I think it was the, 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 they were largely rural areas in the south and they migrated into the cities, which were dominated by Ali Whites, they were predominantly Sunnis, um, and they ended up, um, and they ended up, you know, kind of moving into these, create, creating, creating these kind of ethnic tensions. Um, and at the same time, we had all of these other things going on. We had uh, the peak of oil production, 
uh, in Syria in 96, which kind of, you know, the Syria transitioned from being an, an oil exporter into, into basically a, a state that had to import energy. Um, and their uh, oil revenues were hemorrhaging by the time we kind of, as we get closer and closer to the kind of the 2011 Arab Spring kind of trigger point, um, all of these things began to converge. And at the same time, we had all these other kind of uh, events going on. You know, we had like the climate, global climate change impacts on food baskets around the world. So, you know, we had all of this kind of perfect storm of events. Um, and I think what's interesting to see is how, you know, all of that earth system disruption, when you look at what actually happened in Syria and the way Bashar al-Assad responded, the way protesters responded, the way the United States and Russia and Iran responded, no one was talking about or thinking about earth system disruption. No one cared about climate change. No one thought about resource depletion. No one thought about these complex interlink, interlinked things. You know, there were scientists and experts and you know, kind of informed commentators who were pointing some of these things out, but no one was actually looking at these things and saying, maybe we should think about these things and how we respond. Instead, it was geopolitics, oil, money, terrorism, blah, 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 blah. So your whole human system essentially moved into this response phase, which had nothing to do with the things that triggered it. And that destabilization further destabilized things. You know, so we had all of that military conflict and all the rest of it. Um, and so what happened as a result is that your human system went into this process of self-reinforcing destabilization, which inhibited a, a capacity to respond to what was going on. And I think in some ways you could look at the, the, the Trump administration coming into power in 2016 and say, you know, the Brexit elections and the kind of on the consequences of that are two examples of how across the West we actually had these really maladaptive political responses to a crisis. You know, like there was a big migration crisis that impacted the world, especially Western countries with you know, big concerns about this. But the response was essentially, let's become, let's kind of weaponize this kind of xenophobic politics and exclusionary politics, but again, had nothing to do with dealing with these problems at all. And as a consequence, the politics that resulted made us far more vulnerable to all of these crises and so what happens, you fast forward and what happens is instead of us taking action such as the Green New Deal or building resilience and doing things that, you know, have certainly become more mainstream as people have become aware of the crisis in the last few years, which is a good thing. Um, but instead of those things being part of the policy instrument um, on the table, we had the opposite things. We had, you know, things being slashed. We had, you know... Uh, environmental protections being done away with oil and gas being ramped up um i mean it was i mean it's been it's been mad it's kind of madness and so here we are in um 2020 and we have this pandemic which is raging around the world um so what's essentially happened is that human system destabilization has allowed earth system disruption to continue um, we haven't done anything about it. So those causes, those systemic processes continue to brew away. And as they escalate, the human system is weaker. And so the concern that I had is that you, you know, we're, in, we're already part of this and scientists talk about amplifying feedbacks. So we have this amplifying feedback process where earth system disruption drives human system destabilization, which weakens our capacity to respond. When we have another earth system disruption that that's that's now amplified which further weakens the human system from responding um and then you have an amplifying process and the result of that as your human system goes into this process of decline um as earth system disruption escalates um now when you look at that model it's a way of kind of just thinking about how and why a process of collapse can begin why it might take a certain period of time um, but and, and how it can end up kind of self-reinforcing. But also, when we look at that, we can see how at every step of the way, none of this is inevitable. There's always, there's always a possibility of actually changing the way that we respond um, 
it's it's not a process that is built in at any time um, and, and even when you go deeper into that process there's still a possibility of of pulling back and even though you may unleash certain processes but there's this possibility of adapting so the third framework that i wanted to get out there and have people make sense of things was um uh, produced by c.s holling uh, an ecologist who found a really um, insightful way of framing the life cycle of natural ecosystems, um, and which is you know highly relevant to understand how systems kind of grow and decline. And when you apply it to the human societies or industrial civilization today, um, it provides a really insightful way of understanding where we are and why we're facing the kind of things that we're facing right now. Um, so he kind of had this four stage uh, kind of classification for the stages of the life cycle of a system. Um, so you start off with this kind of um, this growth phase. And it seems like um, we had maybe 500 years ago, we, we the civil, our civilization, our current civilization began this growth phase, which kind of began to accelerate almost exponentially around the time of the industrial revolution. Um, and then we had this kind of 100 to 200 years of quite rapid growth, um, which began to kind of level off to some extent um, between 1950 to 2000. Um, but certainly I would say around um, 1970 to, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, year 2000 or 2000 and, and, and three, 2004, um, you know, you can see that as this almost like this um, kind of stabilization of what, what C.S. Holling calls this conservation phase when the system is really consolidating itself. Um, and one of the things we probably noticed at that time, I think that period coincides with what some would have said was, was kind of the age, the kind of the golden age of, of neoliberal globalization, um, certainly from 1980 to the year 2000. Um, but then since then, using C.S. Holling's uh, framework, you know, we, he, you know, he then says that systems move into this kind of release phase where the system begins to weaken, it begins to break down, it begins to decline. Uh, we see lots of releases of energy. Um, and one of the things that happens is as the system breaks down, there is a lot of kind of chaos and uncertainty. And this kind of paves the way for what he describes as as this fourth phase of reorganization where there is now this space to reorganize the system and create a kind of a new life cycle. Uh, so there's this, an, a new kind of phase for a system and the system would be, could be a new system, could be a new uh, kind of structure. Um, but it appears to be this, the case that right now, all of these, you know, looking at all of this data and using his framework, that we are moving into that release phase and that we were moving into the release phase, you know, before the pandemic. And I think one of the things that indicates this is first of all, um, the kind of the, the sense in which minority ideas uh, or kind of ideas, which seem seeming to be fringe or not something that people would take notice of are suddenly they're up and up for grabs, you know, and that has positives and negatives on the one hand, you know, the negative has been, the, the, the kind of meteoric rise of fringe, extreme right-wing ideas, which have suddenly found their way into the mainstream in ways that um, I would say 10 years ago, we would have thought would never have happened. Um, but also we've seen how groups like Extinction Rebellion, uh, the Sunrise Movement, um, the idea of the Green New Deal, um, many ideas and policy ideas and things, which again, 10, 15 years ago, we would not have expected these to be on the table, have now become ex not just mainstream, but in some cases have actually become policy to the extent that you have you know, the European Union um, accepting the idea of the Green New Deal. It's now official part of their strategy. British government, you know, it's a, it's a right-wing Tory government, but they've, they kind of have been one of the first to say that we're going to have net zero commitments by 2050. Again, all of this is still too little, too late, but it's still, um, we shouldn't underestimate the kind of implications of how much things have changed. Um, but of course, you know, those are kind of cosmetic things. And I think one of the 
key things that we've seen in this last few years is so many other factors to do with the energy system, the acceleration of climate change, the kind of uh, increasing uh, alarm signals about the food system, you know, water scarcity escalating, all of these red flag indicators of fundamental processes going deeply wrong with how our civilization is structured, how the system is operating, all of which indicate that, yeah, we've, mo- we've definitely been moving into this decline phase. Um, but at the same time, one of the things that indicates is that the ability to, you know, for small perturbations in the system, for kind of the micro actions, for, for, uh, for kind of small groups of people and so on and so forth to have an outsized impact to kind of have a much more wider uh, consequence how the system goes forward in the next few weeks, months, and years. That's all changing. It's all up for grabs. Um, So essentially what I wanted to kind of uh, really communicate to people with that piece was that the pandemic that we're seeing now is really just a part of this wider systemic process where we've essentially moved into this last stage of the life cycle of civilization. Um, and that puts us in this, you know, on the one hand, it's very scary and very frightening and, and very um, alarming to find ourselves at, at the, at the kind of the tail end of a civilization that, that all the signs are telling us that it's on its way out essentially. But at the same time, there's also this unprecedented opportunity to play this role in what comes after in the, in, in, in this new life cycle. And so we find ourselves in a way on the cusp of this emergence. Um, and I really wanted to have kind of create this sense for people of, of this openness that what may come after, that even if we're seeing this, of course, we're going to see um, a lot of really bleak things in the next few weeks and months, you know, as, as we move into this, uh, the, you know, move clearly into this, into, into the deeper in deepening impacts of the of the public health catastrophe that our governments have essentially ushered in by failing to take actions that they needed to take early on and so on and so forth but at the same time as we watch this system weaken and decline the opportunities to to kind of set down what comes next is now you know again it's more and more in our grasp and i think really that's that's the challenge of our times really is to, is to situate ourselves and to see how can we as individuals, communities, people within different parts of this system, how can we play a role within our context as parts within, you know, we have, all of us have different modes of access to the system in different ways, depending on our context. And I think that challenge is for each of us to kind of identify what are the leverage points that we can use? What are the skills and the resources that we can bring um, and how can we maximize our impact within that context to have that kind of slightly more outsized consequence? Um, I think that's really the task we have ahead. So in a way, it's frightening, but it's also, um, it's also um, there, there is a genuine opportunity, I, I, I do believe, to, to, to set the course of where humanity goes in the next decade. Thanks for that. That was... Uh... That was quite a crash course, I think, in systems thinking, and I think very helpful for people's own framing of what of this moment that we're in. I think that, uh, and and I, I'm sure you would agree with this. The lack of systemic thinking is, I think, one of the biggest things that has is holding us back societally, certainly amongst our leadership. Right. So, you know, in in my view. This is a lot. I think a lot of the, the, the work that you've put in over the years and, and we have post government Institute as well has been trying to orient people in that way to, to recognize we can't predict what you talked about, you know, synchronous failure. Um, we don't know what would be the, you know, the tipping event necessarily, but that because we have these complex systems, all the codependent interacting with one another, all of them in various states of of vulnerability and fragility, and brittleness, um, that it can be a snowball effect or a domino effect that happens when, when an event, which obviously this is, 
in and of itself, this pandemic is is a very severe event. We don't know exactly how it's going to unfold, but the larger implications, uh, I think, are really key and important for people to figure out. And it's difficult to do that in a moment where we're dealing with a lot of immediate fear, immediate concerns. I think that, in fact, this is one of the challenges we have in all kinds of crises is that because it's so destabilizing, that people do have a tendency to want to go back to normal. In a sense, I don't want to get into a political conversation, but you know, my view that in some ways is, is the, the thing that Joe Biden is offering people in the United States as an alternative to Donald Trump is let's go back to normal when we had like a normal presidency. You know? Unfortunately, we're not in normal times. We weren't, in, we weren't going into normal times even before the pandemic. You know, and um, and so I think it's incredibly useful for people to understand that we are going through really transformative changes. If we are, I, th- I think that um, you're right. The adaptive life cycle uh, framework I think is very useful for people to to think about because if we are going through this kind of collapsed and released phase right now, and then there's this opportunity for reorganization. When it's recognizing that in some ways collapse, and that's a loaded word, um, maybe we call it release, this sort of letting go and all this energy coming out of the system, uh, creating all kinds of disruptions. We can't put the genie back in the bottle. You know, it's no amount of stim- economic stimulus packages or other kinds of interventions that we might do, you know, improvements in the health system uh, are going to get us back to normal, Right. Uh, I think it's important even psychologically for people to to kind of wrestle with that and, and and come to some some level of acceptance about that because then we could think about okay now it opens up things and and where we go uh, is up up for grabs in a sense and uh, one one thing we didn't he didn't talk about but I think is is really connected. Um, as another sort of framework is, is the shock doctrine. And for, mm. for those, you know, who are watching or listening to this, um, you know, the shock doctrine is something that Naomi Klein, uh, I think really popularized coming from, you, you mentioned neoliberal economics coming from Milton Friedman, sort of the guru of ne- neoliberal economics. Um, and, you know, the concept there was that it's really moments of crises, right? Whether the crises are real or perceived that, you know, new ideas emerge, right? So he was basically saying that their job is, as people who wanted to advance a neoliberal economic, you know, platform was to develop these ideas that may be marginal alternatives on the edges, totally politically implausible in the, in the moment where things are stable, but when there is a crisis or at least a perceived crisis, it presents this opportunity for new ideas to emerge. So what was politically implausible becomes politically inevitable. And I think that we're clearly seeing that right now. I mean, we have proof of the shock doctrine, I would say, because you talked about ideas that are emerging, the Green New Deal and others. I think a lot about the concept of universal basic income. And just looking at that as kind of a microcosm of this shock doctrine in effect, you know, you had this concept being, you know, developed really at the margins as a kind of a policy solution to address people's, you know, immediate needs and inequality issues. Uh, you had some strange bedfellows, I would say, in Silicon Valley who were also on board with that, maybe for, for reasons I wouldn't agree with. Um, and then you had some, some trials of this in some cities like in Europe, and I think Finland maybe experimented with it a little bit. Uh, then you had here in the United States, uh, a relatively marginal candidate running for the de- democratic you know nomination who's really running on this idea of a universal basic income that will send thousand dollar checks to every adult in the United States every month um, put that on the sort of the platform now you have a crisis that hits you know and it's very feasible at this point I mean they're talking about cutting maybe one check right now for people but I especially if this thing lasts I could see that this becomes policy here in the United States. So in a very short period of time, you know, an idea that was really marginal becomes institutionalized. And I think that we're seeing there's going to be a battle here in a sense, because I think what some people are trying to offer is a return to the conservation phase, right? Mm. That they benefited from, right? So 
a lot of, you know, policies and interventions are about trying to get back to where we were, which is this idea, like, let's get back to that stability. Uh, and then other people offering kind of shock doctrine ideas that the shock doctrine itself is kind of agnostic, right? It could be, it could be used for good. It could be used for, for ill. And I think we're going to have a lot of um, battle lines being drawn and in opposing ideas and visions. But what's clear is that the status quo can no longer hold. And we already had that clearly in place, I think, with our current energy system hitting the wall and climate change, and biodiversity loss and, you know, um, inequality that, that has reached a point in, in certain countries that is just simply untenable, you know? Um, so what do we do now? Right. Is, is I think the key question. So I'm curious, uh, if this is a moment, right. For reorganization, what would you kind of advise people who, who are listening to, to consider? And obviously this is maybe thinking a little bit beyond the immediate crisis that, that we're in. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, part of the challenge with this thinking about this is that we you know, the, the immediate crisis is almost overwhelming um, mm-hmm. in its kind of uh, current impacts. You know, it's like, p- apart from the fact that we're surrounded by, you know, all the time now in the, in the mainstream, in the media, it's, it's always being covered. Um, and it's kind of superseded all other coverage of anything else. Um, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's just, it's the way our <laughs> media system operates. It's a little bit, it's a little bit maladaptive in the sense that, again, it's just very, it's very reactive, you know, I, I'm, 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 and, you know, it's worth looking, just bearing that in mind. The media system is our, is our kind of collective sense making capacity and it's completely dysfunctional. It just, you know, it's just, it's just reacting again to the symptom on its surface, coronavirus, 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 blah, blah, blah. blah. And it's like, it's, it's very reactive. And when we see the, the play of the, poli- of the poli- the politics and the way the political system has responded again you can see that kind of reactiveness it's it's not really it's very just it's emergency mode you know we're, we're, we're in this you know the legal scientists use this concept called the state of exception where they say you know when there's this massive crisis and it triggers these um these national security doctrines to come into play and what they do is they they kind of put elevate the state to this position of emergency kind of uh, empowerment where, you know, anything goes in order mm-hmm. to, you know, to protect security. Um, and, but it also can be very, very, um, you know, the kind of the lasting consequences of that. And I think we've, you know, we see this in, the, in relation to international terrorism are, you know, draconian politics, um, you know, often, you know, it's a regressive slide into um, kind of the militarization of your societies. So there is that, there is that risk of that's, is that the direction that we're going in? And, and I totally understand why there are many people who are alarmed about that. And there are some people who are obviously skeptical about coronavirus and kind of latching onto conspiracy theories, but because they have this sense of concern and alarm about where does this go? You know, where, you know what, what's happening when we're having all of this lockdown? And I think one of the things that it's worth bearing in mind, first of all, is that all of that stuff that ends up happening, all of this stuff that happens in terms of the response of these political systems, you know, the, the need to have all this emergency stuff. I mean, all of that stuff, could have been avoided to the extent that it's coming in and is always exacerbated by the fact that you don't actually do root and ground kind of system change. Mm-hmm. We know when we've left it to the last minute, when we're kind of not responding properly, you know, that's what you've done. You've left it open. So eventually the state is going to have to come in in this full blown emergency capacity throw out all of the, you know, throw out all the laws and kind of due process that we've had because now there's a massive emergency and you need all sorts of extraordinary powers to contain and deal with that emergency. So I think it's worth remembering that, you know, that clearly that process is now happening. You know, we've, and to some extent, 
to some extent is locked in. I mean, it's not necessarily you know, going to be like that forever, but I think we have to accept that 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 process is now there. You know, states are responding because they failed. They're now locked into certain, you know, there's going to be, um, no matter what happens at this stage, there's going to be a public health catastrophe. You know, uh, healthcare facilities are going to be overwhelmed. I mean, there's the idiots out there who who might be optimistic about this, but, you know, it's just not based on data. So that's going to happen. And as that gets worse, it will bring in all of that machinery into play. And that's not necessarily a result of a conspiracy. It's completely predictable. It's the result of what happens when a system is weak, you know, it, it ends up having to kind of harden itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of that is a result of the brittleness of the system in a way. So that's all worth remembering. And so against that background, you know, I think what's important to realize is that there's lots of things that are going to happen where we may, you know, we won't be able to control those outcomes. We're not going to be able to control what governor so-and-so does and says necessarily. I mean, of course, there's things that maybe some people might be able to do. You know, there may be influence pathways and things like that. We shouldn't discount that. And if there are ways of influencing those systems you know in the near term whatever that's totally fine and we should all do that and you know i still try to do stuff like that with my journalism you know you do that kind of reactionary reporting and you try to cover what's going on and correct it and that we always need to be doing that but i think remembering that there's a long game at play is absolutely critical um and i think looking to where we can be effective in planting seeds for that long game is going to be critical and i think where we're going to see as as this kind of weeks and months kind of continue i think there's two interesting things that are going to happen and we can see the signs of that the first thing is that governments which have essentially favored you know gdp over human life uh one way or another are not going to be looked on very favorably within a year it really doesn't matter what side of the political fence you're on. Um, it, you know, because basically, I mean, fundamentally, people are going to watch their relatives dying um, f- needlessly, and they're going to realise that someone was responsible for this. Um, and they're going to look at the decisions that people like Boris Johnson made and people like Trump made, and they're going to say, this, is, this has happened on your watch. So I think there's going to be a huge political shift in that sense. Again, where that goes and how different people want to exploit that, with, you know, does that mean it's the end of the Republican Party? I don't know. Um, we've seen that these, these particular political systems and economic systems are still, you know, in their own way, they have a certain resilience about them. They're quite, they're quite quick to move things around, to try and recalibrate things. But we need to be aware of that reality, that there is this, there is going to be a lot of anger. There's going to be a lot of uh, a confusion, a lot of concern about why this is happening and who's responsible. And at the same time, I think what's going to happen is there's going to be a clear path of action that does save lives and does, and does contribute more to people um, being able to have, being able to live through this and get through this. And it's going to be based on all the values and all the thinking that hasn't that isn't part of that system that created this mess it's going to be communities and politicians and businesses um you know from within what we might say are kind of parts you know the big you know big levers in the system as well as outside of it all of them saying whoa you know wait this is this is completely unprecedented we need to do something and i think that's a moment that I've seen that's quite interesting or exciting to see that genuinely, you know, people that we may have, um, that we don't like maybe in public life, um, whether it's people in Silicon Valley, whether it's people in incumbent governments taking action because they've realized the devastation of life that, that they've allowed to come in. And I think this is interesting. So for example, when we see, when we saw the fact that the Trump administration, when they received this report from the British science advisors, you know, they did the Imperial College London, this model, 
there are still flaws with that model, but you know, basically correctly said that the current strategy is an absolute disaster. And I think the immediate response clearly of the Trump administration was the same response as the Boris Johnson administration. I remember watching Boris Johnson's press conference and he looked, he looked like he'd seen a ghost. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this, it was a shock. I think it was a genuine shock. And I think there was a kind of like a wake up call that, wait a minute, we can't, you know, you can't, how can we just allow millions of people to die? This is insane. And if someone like Trump and people in the Trump administration are able to kind of vibe with that basic fundamental human thing, <laughs> there's hope. You know, there's, there's genuinely hope. And it's interesting to see that, you know, that Zuckerberg has come out of nowhere and said, okay, guys, I'm going to unleash our 700,000 supply of um, PPE, you know, what kind of respirators or whatever as he had stashed. I mean, for, why the hell did Facebook yeah, have... Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> nearly a million. Like, what the hell were you preparing for, man? <laughs> it's just like, I don't know what dystopian yeah. thing you guys were doing. But, <laughs> fact, fact, but yeah, you've just given it out to all the rest of us. I mean, that's... Right. You shifted course. So there you were preparing for some crazy dystopian future for Facebook. And now you've said, actually, guys... We actually do care about. You're right. That's human, pretty human powerful beings. because that's a almost complete flip from the sort of Silicon Valley liber, libertarian worldview, with, you know, like bunker mentality, to re- recognizing, oh man, we can't hide out from this. We gotta, we yeah. gotta all be in together. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, that's and I think that's shift. the thing. I think so. Th- so for me, what I'm kind of seeing is the the institutions and the and the individuals that make those shifts. And the thing is, Zuckerberg has not created a systemic shift, but he's he's planted a seed in a way, and, and you know, and it may have, you know, and I think it probably will do. It will create, you know, it will inspire other people to do similar things. Mm-hmm. But it's planted a seed, um, and it's the seed and the planting of that seed that lays the foundation for something that could be more systemic. But I think it's what's pivotal. I think for us is to be able to reflect on. You know, this is this is what the new system that we want, the new life cycle. Uh, uh, they could be any kind of cy- life cycle that emerges. I mean, there might not be a life cycle, let's face it, um, in the way the odds are stacked against us. But there could be any number of, you know, there could be a short-lived life cycle of dystopian madness which emerges out of this. There could be something else. But I think we want to look at what is actually possible here and what's possible and what has the greatest chance of success and what I think this crisis is teaching us is that those cooperative values that we associate with protecting life, they're not just nice, you know, maybe, you know, you know socialist ideals or something like that, which some ideologue came up with in the past. They actually have an adaptive objective function. And if we're going to evolve into that next stage, we need to find a way to institutionalize those values into the systems that we're ushering in. If our, if our systems that we want to bring in, the organizations that we work in or the structures that we're part of and that we're building, if they're not able to bring in those values in some way, in a fundamental way into how they operate, not only will they not survive, they will not be able to contribute anything to what's, what we're dealing with right now and what we're going to be dealing with in the future. And I think that's what we're starting to see is that a a system that's truly resilient, it's not, I mean, look at these systems now grappling to try and we have to protect people. So what do we do? Um, Let's, 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 you know, suddenly grab this UBI idea that has been floating around. Um, And so that's kind of, you know, we see, we're seeing that kind of happening, but what, what we what we really need is 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 to kind of build systems which are able to bring up and and kind of leverage these kinds of ideas and and innovate these ideas from within themselves so we rather than us kind of scrambling for answers you know which is what what we do what we see now this haphazard kind of response we're going to kind of throw money here and throw money there and hope for the best and you know to some extent it's going to kind of maybe offer kind of a sort of a minimal lifeboat response. But I think the question we really have is, you know, when all of this comes crashing down, because, you know, 
the economy as we know it is not going to survive this you know and there's all sorts of reasons we can see that but we're at the beginning of the collapse of the shale industry um you know which has been long predicted um we're at the beginning of how these things have a ramifying effect on on the markets and on economic growth and all the rest of it so that challenge of well, how do we create how do we move into a system of engaging with material production and consumption which is necessary to some extent but it's stable and equal um, and fair um, and works in parity with our environment allows us to meet our basic human needs but fundamentally allows us to flourish as human beings and i think that's that's the vision that we need to be kind of looking at how do we move into that yeah i think um i think it's really interesting that if we recognize that there are going to be a lot of actors and forces who want who want to do whatever they can to return us to what was perceived to be kind of the normal status quo state of affairs and we we can come to sort of an internal acceptance that despite whatever efforts they may make or we may make that's an impossibility it may be a te- there may be a temporary there but we know because of all of these various interrelated systems at risk that if it's not the pandemic that tips us it will be something else soon right we've got a looming climate catastrophe by the way um so if we just kind of sort of accept okay those things kind of within the system trying to prop itself up will not succeed maybe we can support the ones that are pro social and beneficial um but we need to create sort of new models new systems and i think there may be two areas there that are are really key one is what you're talking about i think and that's fundamental values so we have had a system this sort of modern capitalist system that 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 we've been living under which has been pushing the individual you know self interest button in us you know and it actually is you know some deeply wired stuff you know within us as as human beings pushing that button repeatedly you know putting it on overdrive because that's what the economy needs to grow right is for us to consume more and to seek satisfaction through consumption and being a good citizen is is being a good consumer right and so we've had a system that has allowed you know in the US here to have 500,000 people sleeping on the street and be okay with that you know and 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 other things that are just in some ways unconscionable um because we've told ourselves a story that we're all in it for ourselves right um this maybe this crisis is forcing a moral a very clear moral and ethical choice in front of us right are we going to accept people dying and so far i've been i've been proud you know the fact that it seems like generally the the global community said okay we're going to hunker down you know that's in a sense not just sac- making a sacrifice because we're worried about getting it but we recognize that we've got vulnerable people that we care about um and that provides an opening for us to say well what values do we really want to live by and if we orient those values to sort of a new narrative a new story that says we are part of a of a global human and ecological system where we're all interdependent you know and that we find meaning and purpose and value in in contributing in that way even if it means we're sacrificing these other things like growth and you know I can buy a new a new iPhone next year or whatever it is you know um i think there's opportunity there and i think that that's a fundamental change that has to exist right in order and it should be a guidepost in a sense for the things that we say this is worth doing or not worth doing right does it does it push those buttons of commu- of communal interest you know we are social creatures we are that as much as we are driven by individual needs um so i think that maybe could be a guiding post for people the other i would say is i think i'm worried that we will see in all this chaos a consolidation of control over you know i don't want to sound like a marxist but you know uh you know the the productive you know system you know labor and capital and 
And you could see Amazon, for example, Amazon, I think, is growing right now tremendously. There's a huge opportunity for them. They've already killed off a lot of local business. Now there's an opportunity here where literally businesses left and right, you know, are on life support, if not going to die off. Right. And they could step into the fold. These large corporations step in the fold and provide everything or seek to provide everything. And I think more than anything, we need to really shore up our local resources, our local businesses, you know, local food production, local energy production, local goods and services, even, and this may sound stupid, but things like local bookstores really matter again, you know? Um, and if we're going to put resources to anything, let's try to support those things because we're going to desperately need that, you know? Um, so maybe those are two areas I think for folks listening, I would say, as a guidepost for, for where you might, inf- you know, put your energies. But fundamentally, I think this is why I really appreciate this conversation and, and your writings, understanding the system, systemic, you know, forces at play here and that we are talking about major phase shift. We're talking about synchronous failure and a phase shift. This is, this is the real deal here whether it's this particular moment, this pandemic, or a you know, larger story, that's what we're in. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, the points you raised are about um, localization are really pertinent. And what's interesting is how in, even in, I mean, this, is, this crisis has triggered, and it's happened so rapidly, and I think we're only at the cusp of it. But if you imagine in the space of a couple of weeks, people are already having conversations about what do we do about the fact that GDP is probably going to crash right now? What does this mean for globalization? What about hyperlocalization? How do we sustain resilience in our communities? So suddenly the discourses that um, have been really niche, you know, this idea of localization suddenly become so relevant because in order to, to get through this, if you have strong local institutions where you can source your your you know your resources and food and water and all the things you need within a local community and you can all kind of band together and support each other that's 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 that you're in the best position to kind of get through this and get to the other side whereas if you're massively dependent on complex you know global supply chains which are already at risk it becomes far more difficult. You know, you, you know, you, you don't know how to, how you're going to deal with things, where you're going to get things from, blah, 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 blah. The, you know, the fragility of the supermarket chains, the, the, the impact of panic buying and supply and demand, mm-hmm. all of that stuff is, is we're seeing how brittle those systems are when it, we you know in the face of a crisis. So there's been a lot of conversation about, um, you know, I've seen various you know, pundits talking about, you know, the fact that everything is now going to be hyper local, and it now leads, but it now leads us into this question of: Are we going to go down this pathway of borrowing endlessly to sustain this massive government expenditure that is now coming? You know, massively increasing the, the already unsustainable levels of debt, um, and not even to grow the economy, just to kind of keep people going mm-hmm. like some kind of crazy life support machine. And what happens when you can't do that anymore, which, you know, we're already at a point where we can't really do this anymore. So where are we going with this? This is not, not going to work. Um, so, so there is this challenge now of how do you hunker down? How do you care for the people that you love, the, the vulnerable people around you, but you don't continuously grow materially? And we're being forced to ask this question, what's possible, guys, human beings, what's possible? And whereas before, we were constantly being told uh, by neoclassical economists that it's not possible. You can't grow your economy and um, kind of like have too much leeway with distribution is let it trickle down. And then we're told you can't, you can't have someone stopping you from growing your economy and continue to, to protect life expectancy. And we're always told what you can't do. I think now we're at this point, we're kind of being forced to ask this question of, we want to be able to feed people, clothe people, house people, all the rest of it. How do we do that in this way without having hyper globalization, 
without having these massive complex supply chains, how do we do it? Um, and the thing is, is that all those, many of those questions have been answered by, um, you know, what you might call heterodox, you know, heterodox economists um, of all different persuasions who've been looking at the realities of how the economy actually works um, and saying that actually this isn't a sustainable economic system. It's not even a healthy economic system. It's not even an economic system in which most people who are benefiting from it ostensibly are actually particularly happy. Mm -hmm. So we don't, why do we need this? So it's forcing us to, to, to ask those questions. And I think what, what's interesting is that the practical demands of how we have to live now on a day-to-day -day basis in our communities Well, you know, I'm in an apartment block, you know, we have elderly people living here. There's other people who have communities who there'll be elderly people around who are vulnerable, more vulnerable people who are ill. And I think the question that everyone has to ask themselves is, okay, so what's the new ways that we now mobilize? Can we use our community? You know, are we going to use WhatsApp groups, which is happening? You know, WhatsApp groups are blossoming everywhere where people are mobilizing to support each other. How can I support my neighbor? How can I help them with the things they need? And this is a nascent stage. Mm -hmm. But will we kind of come out of this? The question that we're going to be having to ask ourselves is, you know, why, again, there's a reactive approach, which is I need to go to the supermarket to make sure that my elderly neighbor has got, you know, paracetamol or whatever medicine they need or blah, blah, blah. But the longer term approach is, how do I make sure that we in this urban environment actually have food and it's not just reliant on a supermarket chain? And it's not just a question that I think, you know, there's, you know a lot of people are doing this survivalist thing of saying, you know, how do I grow my own food in my backyard kind of thing? And it's not that, you know, even though that's great as well. But I think that the answer is, how do we get people in the supermarkets the people who run these businesses, the chief executives to realize, wait a minute, this system of, you know, calibrating our food supply and having it, you know, just about ready to kind of deliver based on market considerations of what they think demand might be. Um, and, you know, reliant on kind of giant agribusiness uh, supply chains. Wait a minute, let's just rethink all of this. Let's, let's, let's think about a different approach so now I think there's this opportunity in a way to have those conversations at all levels of society where we begin to ask ourselves whether we're in policy, whether we're in government, whether we're working in different business sectors, whether we're in small or large businesses. Wait a minute, these operationals, these operations that we have in place, they haven't worked. They, they haven't defended me. They haven't kept me safe. They're not working right now. How can I improve these? How can I make them work? And I think in a way that's our challenge is we want to be able to rebuild our communities and we also want to be able to make sure that we can't convince people like Boris and Trump maybe, but are there other ways that we can have, you know, cultivate this kind of really generative dialogue with all of these people in different sectors to say, guys, we need to have a fundamental rethink about how we're operating these structures because they're not working. They're completely and utterly brittle. When there's another pandemic, or when there's another crisis, climate change or a resource depletion issue, this is, you know, who knows what could happen. So let's, let's rebuild and let's restructure and let's have that conversation. But I think the space is now opening. Almost, in, you know, it's almost, we get, it will come, it'll come a point where it'll be wide open and people will want to know how they can do things differently because they'll see that this this way of doing things is clearly not sustainable it's not working yeah and and i would say and maybe we'll end it here that kind of a challenge to to folks who are watching and listening to this conversation if you're one of those people you are an early adopter to this right you you're somebody who's seeking to understand and think about things in in a more systemic way and hopefully our have either already arrived in a place or going through this process of sort of letting go of an expectation that the old system needs to stay, you know, and, and to hold on to it with, you know, with both hands. And that means that you need to bring other people along, right? So I think part of our task as early adopters to this is to, is to practice what we preach, right? So if we say we need 
to have a value shift away from the individual to the to the community and by the community i mean even the global community practice that and then bring the other people in your life and in your community along to recognize that because there is going to be a huge hankering that when we sort of come out of this immediate crisis to go back to like you know put it behind us and go back to where we were to help people understand there is no going back to where we were right it didn't work for many people in any case and and the genie's out of the bottle so if you could bring other people along it's really key because we need as many people to understand that the old way of doing things is no longer and 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 then let's experiment you know i don't i don't know that there's a single solution out there and uh and the system that we've been in wasn't created overnight. The new system is not going to be created overnight as well. So it's okay to experiment and to fail as long as we're doing it together and learning from it. Um, so I really appreciate, first of all, your time, Nafiz, and then um, your, your continued exploration of these themes, I think, is really key. There's few people, unfortunately, I think, who are writing and, and certainly in the media that are doing that work. Hopefully we can get a lot more systems thinkers out there you know, in policy and in, in the media and kind of every aspect of life. So I appreciate you you being at the forefront of that. Thank Thanks you so much. Asha. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate the conversation. Yeah. Take care. Be safe. Um, I you hope too. your your family is going to be all right. And um, and let's stay in touch. Okay. Thanks, Asha. Thanks. Take care. Hey, to get more information or to stay updated whenever we put out a new episode, go to postcarm.org slash crazy town and make sure you sign up for our email list.